We are back, and we are joined by Dave Jordan of News9.com, the Oklahoma City NBC affiliate out of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Wait, I, I guess no, no, he previously worked there. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure what the affiliate is here. Yeah. Well, why don't you just, for starters, describe what happened outside of this video. In other words, what have you been, been able to surmise is the case? I mean, why was this woman going to the hospital? Why were these people pulled over in the first place? What happens before we get to see, uh, I guess, the son take his cell phone camera and start documenting the event? Okay, well, before I say anything, I have to say that I'm with the CBS affiliate in Oklahoma City, KWTV. Okay. So let's get that out there. All right. Um, we got a call on... Memorial Day this past Monday uh, from the gentleman who shot that video, Kenyatta Davis. He told me that his mother had suffered heat stroke. His mother lives in the town of Bowley, which is in another area of Oklahoma, and every weekend, they, every year, they have this rodeo that goes on, and he was with his mom, and they attended the rodeo, and he actually lives in Oklahoma City, but he was visiting with his mother, and he stayed the weekend. Well, his mom was doing some work outside of the house and suffered from an heat exhaustion, he told mm -hmm. me. So they called an ambulance, which was run by the, they called 911, as you would expect, and mm -hmm. the ambulance picked them up from the Creek Nation. It's the Creek Nation, uh, the Indian tribe, which runs the ambulance that services that area. Well, they picked him up, and they picked up his mother, and they were riding to the emergency room in a nearby town called Prague to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And what happens, what happens after that is a matter of debate between the Oklahoma Highway Patrol and the Davis family, but mm -hmm. judging from what the Davis family told me, that's all I can pretty much tell you is what they told me. And what all I right, was, so, so from the perspective of the Davis family, how, how does this all occur? I mean, we, do we have any other eyewitnesses outside of the Davis family? Has well, anybody we, else? We, okay. did hear from, we did hear from some other eyewitnesses yesterday who pretty much confirmed the Davis family's version of events. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you what those events are. They were riding down Highway 62 through a, t a town called Payton. And they were not running hot, uh, as they say. They did not have on their siren. They did not have on their lights, their, their lights. They were just driving down the road, which did not have a lot of traffic and was a winding road, as you would expect on a, on a holiday weekend in a small town. Mm -hmm. And they said within a matter of seconds, they saw an OHP trooper pull up next to them, just out of nowhere. The OHP trooper, according to the Davis family, was not running his, uh, his hot either. They had... That they had the lights on, they didn't have the sirens on. So mm -hmm. this trooper just got in his car, according to the Davises, and drove up to the ambulance and on their way to a separate call. They were responding to a call of, a, I believe, a stolen car. Okay. Then they called for backup, and another ambulance came over. Another, I'm sorry, OHP trooper car came over. Mm -hmm. And they got into an argument because the troopers believed that the ambulance did not yield to them so that they can respond to this call. Okay. The ambulance maintained, the paramedic maintained, Paul Frank was the one driving, and he said in a written statement that he did not hear them, and because of the trajectory of the road and how it was winding, he could not see them. He didn't know that they were driving up that quickly until after they had passed him or when they approached him. Okay. So had he known that, he would have yielded. Okay. Well, the troopers went and dealt with their official business, and once that was concluded, they turned or they stayed where they were, and when the ambulance was passing... They stopped them and pulled them over to ticket them for not yielding. The paramedics, the first one they dealt with was Paul, and he pretty much said, well, you know something, let's deal with this at the hospital. I have a patient in the back that is being treated. We need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. he, he maintains that the trooper in question, his name I believe is Daniel Martin, Mm -hmm. started yelling and said, you know, get your blank in my vehicle. I'm writing you a ticket now. This is ridiculous. You should have yielded. Is, let's stop for a second. This is, the, this is the driver. This is the older white gentleman with the glasses, correct? Right. Okay, right. okay. Right. That's what he's saying is that is what happened. Now, mm -hmm. Kenyatta Davis was riding in the passenger side of the ambulance mm -hmm. and saw all of this happen, saw them yelling and screaming. Mm -hmm. So he just stayed inside. Well, apparently... The other paramedic, that would be the black gentleman, his name is Maurice White, he mm -hmm. came out of the car and said, listen, we have to go and get this patient treated to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a mini scuffle that occurred, according to OHP and according to him, 
where they tried to arrest him, and he said, no, you're not arresting me. If you, if you, if you want to take this up, let's go to the hospital, and once we get this patient admitted, then you can do whatever you want to do. And now this is before um, the uh, passenger, the son, starts filming at all. There's a scuffle before the There's filming There's a scuffle begins. before the filming that we have not seen that, that okay. apparently was recorded by dash cam video, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay. The, the driver um, is still outside the vehicle. Mr. White goes back in and begins working on Kenyatta's mother, you know, trying to get her up to speed. And at that point, Kenyatta comes out of the ambulance to see what's going on, out of the passenger side of the ambulance to see what's going on. And they told him yet again, you know, we are, we're stopped. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. At that point, he pulls out his phone and he starts to record everything. He does a little introduction on the, on the raw video, which you could probably see, and he says, mm -hmm. You know, this is me. OHP just pulled over my mother's ambulance. This is what she. This is because they said that we didn't pull over as we were trying to get her to the hospital. So I'm just going to record some video of what's going on. So once he recorded the video, that that's all the video that you see from that point. That's what we reported. That's what he sent to us, and that's what we reported on. Mm -hmm. And then the ambulance, the OHP trooper tried it to arrest Mr. White again for the second time, and that's when the scuffle ensued. And, you know, in the video, you see Mr. White actually telling uh, Mr. Davis uh, not, to not to get, get involved. involved. Yeah, right. not to get involved. It seems like he's waiting for cooler heads to prevail just to go. Now, before we get into, you know, what may or may not be on that tape, apparently, from the uh, the police cam, isn't there an apparatus out there where these police, instead of pulling over this ambulance, could have contacted uh, the, the ambulance service or the hospital and asked if they were on call or, you know, if they were on an emergency call? Isn't there something there? Couldn't they have done something else other than pull these guys over in a failure to yield when they didn't apparently even have their sirens on? Well, anytime there is a situation where an ambulance is responding to something or a uh police officers responding to something, you can always verify whether there is a call in progress. You know, we may not in the media have that ability, but 911 and other emergency managers can always verify with each other whether there's a call in progress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the failure to yield issue was never disputed by the paramedics. Mm -hmm. The paramedics said, you know, maybe we did fail to yield, but we did not see him. Mm -hmm. Had we seen him, we would have yielded. You know, and they were not denying anything happened. They were not denying that they were trying not to yield, which, which all both parties would probably doubt. They just mm -hmm. wanted the issue handled after the patient was admitted to the hospital. Mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> well, the other, I mean, it seems like the guy is very frustrated, even in the you know 20 or so seconds that he, he's talking to the officer before the physical altercation actually ensues. And he does try to arrest him. I mean, he literally does say, you're under arrest two or three different times. And it's when he tries to cuff him. You know, the guy again mentions the state law, which we have in front of us. Uh, will EMT law protect paramedics? A new law in Oklahoma makes it a felony to attack or injure emergency medical technicians. Uh, but will the law really protect them? I mean, it just seems ludicrous to me that we can't handle this. I mean, if there's anything to handle at the hospital, especially since that's the only EMT in the back with the patient. Well, I can tell you that this when when we heard about this in the newsroom, you know, we got a call on on Monday, and if any of you guys have ever worked in news, you get calls from many people alleging different things, and when you start looking into the story, it's not always as it seems. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the reporters who drew the short straw and was working that Monday on Memorial Day, mm -hmm. and got the phone call from Mr. Davis, who explained his position and talked about what was going on and talked about what happened. And I told him, well, I'm not going to do the story today because I want to give OHP a chance to respond to this. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, that's fine. Just, uh, you know, I'm just going to email you some video. And he did, and I looked at it, and then I looked at it again the next day, and I called him, and his version of events did not change. Now, I contacted OHP, and OHP said that, you know, they referred us to, they, well, the PI, well, let me just say, the PIO that I spoke with, mm -hmm. the public information officer, told me that there was some dash cam video that had been turned over to the district attorney in the, in the area where this all transpired, in Okfusky County. Mm -hmm. The assistant district attorney, her name is Maxie Riley, I've been speaking with her for the past couple of days, and the first version that she told me, what she did tell me initially, was that the dash cam video shows Mr. White attacking the, the uh, trooper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it recorded everything soup to nuts, and Mr. White could be facing charges. 
and those charges could come down as early as this week. And I just checked about mm-hmm. six minutes ago, and she told me there were no charges that were coming down yet. They have not filed. They have not made a decision on whether to file what was going on. And are we going to be able to see this video? I mean, are, are we? I mean, is it going to be to the point where we have to ask for an FOIA request? Are they going to voluntarily let the the public see this? I mean, well, they said that they are not going to release the video until after it goes to trial, or presumably after charges are handed down. So we've been talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, I was told that, you know, that's a decision that will come later on. But, you know, if there's dash cam video that supports the trooper's version of events, then clearly that could go a long way towards seeing what actually transpired.